Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the June 12th school board regular business meeting um, before the summer break. First on our list is adjustment to agendas. Any adjustments? Elizabeth? Oh, God. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Before we do that, we're going to rate rise and do the pledge of allegiance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Nope. Um, let's see, maybe there's one update, but. Okay, so moving on, um, may I have a motion for approval of school board minutes? I move we approve the school board minutes as listed in our agenda. May I have a second? A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Kimberly, all in favor? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, comments from our one student representative. Hi. Um, so just a couple quick updates as we close out the school year. Um, so I'm sure, as some of you may know, we had a very successful graduation um, on Sunday. It was a beautiful day, um, and the ceremony was very nice. Um, so that was a great way to honor our seniors. Um, and then they went on and spent the night in Booth Bay on a sunset cruise um, and went to the Hilltop Fun Center in New Hampshire um, for the remainder of the night. And that's thanks to the High School Parents Association um, for project graduation. So that's really awesome. Um, as for the underclassmen, we had our last day of classes today um, and we'll start finals tomorrow. Um, We've had a lot of end of the year festivities going on. Today we had our underclassmen awards ceremony for citizenship awards um, and yesterday we celebrated the academic piece of that and then yesterday evening we honored um, 17 juniors with um, book awards from various universities. Um, so that was really nice. Um, the guidance department has worked very hard to get schedules out, so um, all of the students have what their, their schedules will look like for the upcoming year um, and can amend that as necessary. Um, we also had student advisory council elections, um, so president, vice president, secretary, treasurer, and then two representatives um, from each class, and they do various jobs within the school, but planning things, working with the administration. Um, and then we have two new school board reps, um, Piper Strunk and Julia Thorak, you will get to know next year. Um, and then just a quick sports update. So boys and girls lacrosse play tomorrow, both play tomorrow in the Western Main Final. Um, the girls play at home versus Greeley and the boys go to Saco to play Thornton Academy. Um, the baseball and softball teams both lost. Um, but they were both in close games um, and made it to the, the boys made it to the semifinals and the girls um, were one run away from beating the first seed Wells. So that was really big for them. Um, two students on the track team, Darcy Cochran and Matt Kincannon, were chosen as conference MVPs for the track team. Um, and the girls and boys teams both got 10-ish, I heard. Um, in the state meet, so uh, that was awesome. The mixed ultimate team won third and the boys team won first in the state meet. Um, so all awesome things. I'll have Mr. Shedd fill you in on tennis. Not quite sure what happened there, but. Um, and then at the state math meet, Elliot Volts came in fourth place. Um, so that was really awesome. So yeah, basically we're just wrapping things up, getting things finalized and looking forward to next year. Thank you so much for being here and in the great school year with you and Emily. Please, if you see her, tell yeah. her thank you also, and of we'll course. miss you next year. Yeah. Tonight's going to be a long meeting, so if you want to skip out at, you know, at the intermission or at any point, because you've got to study, we get it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, next, are there any comments um, from the public on agenda items? Okay. 
Next, we move on to communications. Uh, first, we have um, Jason Mandridis will address or will speak to the principal of the day, I believe. Um, Good evening. Actually, the principal of the day couldn't make it tonight, so uh, Mrs. Fori Pettit will be um, introducing you to the assistant principal oh, of good. the day. <laughs> All right, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I've brought a friend with me. We're going to step right over here so everybody can get a good look at him. He's very dapper tonight. Um, uh, we had a, a bingo night for uh, the PCPA to raise some money, and as part of that, uh, Jason and I offered up our um, incentives to be a principal for the day or assistant principal for the day, and Jacob was the lucky winner of the drawing for assistant principal of the day, and I think I might have had more fun than he did, but um, he is ready to share all about his day with you, so I'll turn it over to him. Hello, my name is Jacob Wood, and I am a kindergartner in Mrs. Rio's class at Pond Cove. Thank you for having me tonight. On Friday, May 11th, I served as the assistant principal for the day at Pond Cove Elementary School. I would like to share my six favorite things about being assistant principal for the day. One, giving out birthday cards to students was fun. At the end of the day, they got to pick a book and take it home with them. Two, I gave out stickers at lunch to third and third grade and kindergarten students if they were behaving in the cafeteria. Three, I enjoyed calling out dismissal. I called out buses and rounds so people knew when to leave and get on the right bus. Three, I four. I read a funny book to second, third, and fourth grade class classes. It was Memoirs of a Goldfish, and it's one of my favorite books. Five. It was fun to do morning announcements and say the joke of the day. Would you like to hear the joke? Yes. yes. <laughs> what does a baseball player do when he wants to dance? I don't know. What? What? He throws a ball. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Six, I declared a walk or bike to school day and pajama day. We had an excellent turnout in participation. Do you have any questions? What was your favorite part besides of the six? Which one was your favorite? I liked reading the book to Second and third grade and fourth grade classes. I'm really impressed with your reading. It's really, really good. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd ever want to be school board chair for a day. For a <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> it's okay. Every single one of you has always said no. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't think so. Thank you. You're Thank great. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you for having me today. You're welcome. Thank you. So, 
Next on our list is a very important recognition of retirees, and I believe we're going to have um, individual um, principals come up maybe and address, starting with Michael Efron. I believe Jeff Shedd is. You, you got a tough act following Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> tough act to follow. I was saying, do you have a joke? <laughs> if I had Good Night Moon, I could, you know. <laughs> I bet Jacob knows that book. Um, so this is Michael Efron. I think he, after I'm done, I think he's going to say a couple words. Um, and his wife, Janet, is sitting on Michael's right. Um, and uh, six months ago, um, Michael and Janet's daughter had their first grandchild, and when he told me they had a grandchild, I had a sneaking suspicion that a resignation was not going to happen <laughs> far after that. So I am, and I told Michael I was delighted for Janet and and him and it, their family, um, but I was really disappointed for Cape Elizabeth High School because we're losing a really outstanding teacher and a pillar of the school. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a few things about Michael. Um, I've been there a long time now. He's been there longer. Um, and we've had many conversations over the years, and I could go on and on. But I'll just say a few things. Um, he is whatever age he is, and he has, and always will have, I think, a childlike, endless curiosity. Um, which is an incredibly endearing quality. He's curious about how students' minds work. He's curious about how kids learn. He's curious not just how kids as a group learn, but how individual kids learn. And he is relentless in attempting to figure that out. Um, he tries to figure out what motivates kids. And he, he's just endlessly curious about that and always thinking about it. How do I get to that student? How do I get Allie Ingalls to learn? Um, he didn't use you as an example, Allie. Um, he, did, he did get me to learn. So, so I'll just tell you just a couple of stories uh, about things. So one of the stereotypes that I always had about physics teachers until I met Michael is that physics teachers were the people who taught the smartest and most well-prepared and most driven seniors. And that's what they wanted to do. That's what they were trained to do. That's what they wanted to do. And when I got there, that's what Michael did. Um, and he could have continued to do that for many years. And virtually every other physics teacher in the world would say, that's what I want to do, because that's what I love to do. I like to challenge the, the, the best minds. And it was either the first or second year I was there, Michael had done some reading about a model of physics, a model of science sequencing that actually started with physics and then went to chemistry and then went to biology. Um, I'm not going to go through the rationale, but um, I will say that we undertook then about a year's worth of study of that model, including which, which began in a number of prestigious private schools. Um, and we ended up visiting Brookline High School, a public high school, but one that had been doing physics first for quite a long time. And I think. Um, physics First has been a success at the high school. Um, I think it causes kids to learn in the very first year in high school what it means to think deeply about things um, and to develop those thinking skills. But one of the things that became quickly apparent to Michael and the other physics teachers is that you can't teach ninth graders physics the way you teach seniors physics. And you can't teach nearly as much um, because otherwise you will just lose students. They will disengage. So what Michael did, or led Michael leading the other physics teachers, is they adopted a strategy of teaching which is called modeling, which is inquiry-based, which basically puts, puts students in the driver's seats um, and puts critical emphasis on the importance of laboratory experiences and then asks kids questions about what they saw in the lab and asks kids to figure out what the significance is and asks kids to figure out what the relationship is between the various things that they are studying. Um, so when I go into the back of Michael's room, I see 90% of the time, Dr. Efron is sitting in the very last row in his classroom at a desk 
And usually, typically, there are students standing in front of the room presenting with whiteboards. They have worked out problems, and they are presenting those problems and explaining their solutions to those problems to the entire class. And if I go in in September, the ninth graders who have had Dr. Efron are wondering, what the heck is this? And they are nervous, and they are uncertain, and they are not confident, and it shows. Um, but he encourages them over the course of the year, so if I go in about April or May, I see, by and large, self-confident students standing up and explaining problems, explaining their thinking, explaining how they think about their thinking, and actually oftentimes self-correcting themselves if they realize in the course of what they're saying that they made a mistake. Now that is a really hard thing to teach because that means you're actually monitoring what you're saying say when you're saying it. Um, or when a student, another student asks them questions realizing that either the student is mistaken or they were mistaken and correcting in that, in that case. So I would say that what Michael values above all is teaching kids how to be better thinkers. Um, he definitely teaches them how, how to think like a scientist. He teaches them uh, the mechanics aspects of physics so that they truly understand it and absorb it. Um, and the way he knows that and we know that is he is insistent that unless he can prove that the students got it, that he doesn't know if they got it. So at the beginning of the year they take what's called a force concepts inventory. At the end of the year they take a force concepts inventory to put to the test his teaching and their learning. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to highlight about, about Michael. He is just endlessly curious, loves, he wants kids to learn so passionately. Um, if I pass his classroom during an achievement period or most free periods, he is surrounded by students. Um, there are students in his classroom who are working on things. He is meeting with one or two students, huddling around, trying to get them over the hurdle. Um, and it really has made him for a, a long time a real treasure, a real gift to the Cape Elizabeth school system. And I will sincerely miss the many conversations that we've had over the years and regret that they may come to an end, although I'm hoping because he lives in Cape Elizabeth that when he's not with his grandchild, he may stop in from time to time, especially on a Friday afternoon. That's always the best time because they're always long, fascinating conversations. So thank you, Michael, for your many years um, of work to the Cape Elizabeth school system. And if you want to come on up here, um, then that would be great. So my colleagues at the high school know the danger of giving me a microphone. <laughs> In a half hour, I'll be about done. <laughs> um, so I, I've been a teacher for a long time, but what brought me to Cape Elizabeth was to be principal of the high school. I got here in 1981 as principal for eight years. And then after that, I believe I was the first curriculum director that Cape Elizabeth ever had. So I thought I would tell you just a couple of stories from when I was principal, a couple of stories from curriculum director, and a couple of stories from being a teacher. Even though I could come home every day and totally bore my wife to tears as to what happened in the class that day. <laughs> um, OK. Um, when I came to Cape Elizabeth High School, graduation requirements were 17 Carnegie units. You guys old enough to know what a Carnegie unit is? <laughs> a Carnegie unit is the amount of credit you get when you take a course that meets every day for the year. Yeah, that's one Carnegie unit. Imagine a course that met every day. <laughs> um, 17 Carnegie units, the, the school had eight periods over four years. You could do the math. The kids weren't going to school very much. And, um, I think it was maybe the third or fourth week that I was principal, headline in the Portland Press Herald. 
New Cape principal calls Cape Elizabeth High School a three-year school. <laughs> and, um, and, it was, and it was, that was exaggerating. I mean, kids could have gotten out of that school in two years. <laughs> so um, I went about uh, making it a four-year high school. And so we phased in bringing the requirement up to 21 Carnegie units. I think I remember that right. And reducing the number of periods from eight to seven. So that there, over four years, there were 28 period slots, 21 required. And so now you can do the math, and the kids are going to class most of the time. And, but that opened up the issue of what did we want to require? What was this new program going to be? And that turned out to be really, really exciting. Because what I did was, brand new principal here, I asked parents to hold teas in their community. And I went to all these tier teas all around town in the evening. And there'd be usually 20, 25 parents at each tea. And I would ask them, what, what do you think should be in a high school curriculum? What should be required? And so what we ended up with really was a collaboration with the whole community as to what we ended up as a requirement. And we came up with requirements, <clears throat> um, if I can remember, um, we required um, a year of fine arts, years before this became a state requirement. We, became, we required uh, a year of technology. We require, I think we up the, English had been four years, I think math had been two years, we pushed it to three. Um, big debate about whether foreign language should be a requirement or not. We decided not to, since 90, 95% of the kids were doing at least two years of foreign language. So it became a real collaborative effort and we phased in this new, uh, this new program. And um, Yeah, I don't think I want to tell you anything else about the high school in 1981. I'm trying to keep it positive. <laughs> um, okay, so then it's 1989 and I'm curriculum director. And I uh, left the principalship and um, being curriculum director then was a whole different uh, uh, requirement, a whole different job than it is now. There were no endless state mandates trying to give the state version for how to improve student learning. Um, so I was able to meet with faculty and in collaboration with faculty develop ideas bottom up rather than everything that happens lately, which is just top-down with not a whole lot of faculty buy-in, like most top-down stuff. Um, and so, the t so I'll, I'll brag about uh, two curriculum areas, but, but before I brag about it, I mean, anything that succeeds at the high school level is because of the kids' education K through eight. If we're successful at the high school, it's because the elementary school and the middle school have set it up so that we could succeed. So um, when I was curriculum director, I actually knew everybody who worked in this district. Now I don't even know everybody at the high school. <laughs> um, so the first, the easiest areas to develop were the areas that were most sequential, foreign language and mathematics. Um, so I'll talk about mathematics first. Um, 
The community was really, really upset with math education. I forget what national test was we were using. It, uh, it's gone out of use and I don't remember the name. But our kids were doing so badly that we were no longer even in the top 10 school districts in the state in terms of how our kids were doing in math. Just comparison in Maine. People were very upset about math education. And I went to many, many conferences and I looked at endless textbook, textbook curriculums and what I was looking for was a curriculum that was really uh, an international based curriculum because the international standard was about two years uh, higher than the US standard. So I was really looking for uh, somebody who had understood what is working internationally and had started developing it for the US and that's what I found and that was back then called Chicago Math. Um, we implemented it in kindergarten um, one of the reasons it was so successful was because of teachers like Deb um, and all your colleagues down in kindergarten and first grade. And this curriculum was so more demanding and so advanced than what the typical U.S. curriculum was that we made the decision that we had it implemented each year new that we couldn't take the first year curriculum and give it to the first graders if they hadn't done the kindergarten curriculum. It would have been too advanced. Uh, and so we started implementing it and we were implementing it correctly uh, through second grade. And then a whole lot of other things happened. Um, oh, I just love complaining about the school committee here. The school committee decided that there were way too much money being spent in central office and they decided they no longer could afford a curriculum director. And, and so after about three years of implementing this, kind of the K through 12 coordination began evaporating. And um, so what happened was when these kindergartners started getting up to middle school um, and then to high school, all of a sudden Cape Elizabeth was number one in math in the state again. And that's what happened. Um, the other curriculum area, which was uh, easy to coordinate was foreign language, also very sequential. And so I came to the school committee and I recommended that foreign language should really start at the kindergarten level. All the evidence is that kids learn foreign language better the younger they are. We traditionally start teaching it at high school just where it really starts getting hard to learn a foreign language. Didn't make a whole lot of sense. The school committee uh, didn't go with kindergarten but they went with fourth grade. And that's how FLES started, foreign language in the elementary schools. Um, <clears throat> I stick by my original recommendation. When you have the money, start it at kindergarten. <laughs> um, enough of my curriculum years. I'll just tell you two things about my years as being a teacher. And I won't talk about physics first or modeling since Jeff talked about that. We're talking about kids. I think this was, this story is so old that I, and I will make it vague enough that I don't think anybody will know who I'm talking about. And even if they're listening on TV, I don't think they're going to know who I'm talking about. So um, we're doing physics first, physics in the ninth grade. And <clears throat> this girl is in so this was at the honors section. Back then I was teaching all the levels. This girl was in an honors class and she sat in the first row and she couldn't focus her eyes. Uh, and I looked at her and I said, 
what's with this kid? Um, cross-eyed, but not always cross-eyed. Sometimes her eyes were going out. And um, so I started, so sometimes a couple of kids just intrigue me and I want to understand them. Other, all kids intrigue me, but some kids have, they stand out in some way. So I started working with this girl and her uh, reading was terrible. She couldn't focus. <laughs> um, she didn't think well. Uh, and I noticed the most amazing thing. I'm working with her after school. And after about 30, 35 minutes, all of a sudden, her eyes are no longer crossed and she's focused. And all of a sudden, her thinking is better. And I keep working with this girl probably two, three days after school a week for the whole year. And by the end of the year, this kid was a strong student and she wasn't, and she, and her eyes were no longer cross-eyed. And I don't know, I couldn't tell you exactly why that happened, but I could have measured for you the progress. Um, the other t t teaching story I'll tell you just happened today, my very last experience teaching. Um, I invited kids to come after school today to study for the finals. I encouraged them to come to stu after school to study for the finals. We started at 2.30. There were probably 30 to 34 kids in the room. And um, I start giving them problems. I started with straight conceptual stuff and, and then gave them problems that are harder than that they're going to see on the final. And they always say, is this on the final? And I said, might be. <laughs> and then they'll say, how many questions like this on the final? I said, about 20. <laughs> um, so, so here's what happened. I'm making up these problems different than what they've seen all year, but same concept. And they're getting more and more interested in the problems. Uh, one hour goes by, only about five, six kids have left. And I'm looking at them and I'm saying, half of you have a final, 8 a.m. tomorrow. You need to go home and rest. And they say, no, no, give us another one. We finally finished at a quarter to five. And they would have, there were seven kids that still would have stayed, except I said, I've had it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the one comment I said to them, really, really, it occurred to me to share this with them, because one of the boys, Max, said uh, to one of the problems I was giving them, I said, wow, this is a lot of steps. So I said to them, when you came out of eighth grade, you did nothing more than one or two step problems. That's, that's what you experienced. This problem that virtually every one of the kids there solved on their own was at least 20 steps. And I said, you're doing a 20 step problem. You started the year doing a one or two step problem. That's how much your thinking has developed. And you should congratulate yourselves because you are all terrific. That was my last teaching experience just a couple of hours ago. And I'm sad. <laughs> Thank you.
Jason, do you want to introduce Wendy? Good evening again. Hard to follow. A lot of history there. Thank you so much. And I don't think that you're, that was probably your last teaching moment. I think you're, you're continuing to do that tonight. So thank you. So I have two amazing folks to honor tonight. And um, I, although I don't have the historical perspective um, that many do, um, I feel like um, I've known both of these folks for, for quite some time. So I'm going to start with um, Deborah Jordan Pearson, um, who is sitting over there. I think many of you know her. Uh, she is currently, for four and a half more days, a literacy interventionist at Pond Cove, um, working with some of our very youngest and uh, most tangled learners. Very challenging work, takes a lot of ded dedication, a lot of resilience, um, an unbelievable amount of heart and caring um, for children to do this day in and day out. Um, so Deborah has um, been in education, making a positive impact for 41 years, and 33 of those years has been in Cape Elizabeth, and that's a long time. Uh, she's really well known at Pond Cove um, for her depth of knowledge and her skill. Uh, mostly, uh, she's known for just being an, an exceptionally caring, kind, and thoughtful individual. Uh, she's the complete package. It's very clear you know, within just a few weeks of, of working with her this year um, that she's a very, very special person to Pond Cove, the students, the staff, and the families. Uh, so she, she has many gifts to share with students. She's helped hundreds and hundreds of kids read and, and write as a classroom teacher and an, an interventionist. And she also shares a lot of gifts with the staff as well, uh, being kind of that voice of reason, even keeled. Um, we call her in when we need balance, I think, <laughs> in our discussions. So, um, so thank you so much for that. So we are really happy for you, but it's going to be a huge loss for Pond Cove, and I wish you the best of luck and happiness in retirement, and good luck with your new home. And I still suggest that you just do not hook up the internet. Just leave it unhooked, because you don't have it yet, do you? No, leave it that way. So thank you, Deborah. Would you like to come up? I will only come to say thank you. Just to say thank you. I know that it wouldn't be like you to not. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your kind words. And I don't want to go on and on. I've been here long enough. You've heard enough of me. But I do want to thank you all for the opportunity. I know CAPE has always attracted amazing teachers, and I feel like I've been really fortunate to be surrounded by so many peers and colleagues and also parents that are exceptionally supportive, <clears throat> children that are willing and ready to learn. I think all of that has made us a unique community, and I've certainly benefited from sharing in, in all the learning in the community. And thank you for my colleagues, because you certainly have elevated my teaching every day when I've come to work. So thank you, and uh, I wish Kate Elizabeth the very best. It's been a pleasure, and it's been a very, very deeply rewarding professional opportunity for me here. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. We have another very special Pond Cove family member to uh, honor tonight. Uh, Wendy Terrio has, is uh, currently a, a special education ed tech three at Pond Cove. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the very significant impact she has on the lives of her children and, and her colleagues, but just to kind of share a little bit of history that I do know. Uh, Wendy has a, a, a long history in Cape, uh, starting in kindergarten, and some of you may have to help me through this, but um, farm cottage, cottage farm school, a small schoolhouse, so started there in kindergarten, attended Pond Cove starting in third grade, and then attended Cape schools all the way up through 12th grade, and even um, did her um, student teaching as a college student in Cape Elizabeth in a kindergarten classroom. So we're talking a major um, commitment and history to, to this community. So um, she, and kind of a fun fact, she met Deborah Jordan Pearson in 1979, right, at Breakwater School in Portland. And so they have a long history together of friendship as well as, as being colleagues. So that's just something else that I just think is very special about CAPE. We have a very strong sense of community and this is a great example of that. Uh, so what th the amazing contribution that Wendy makes as an educational technician, which is her current position, is she enables many children to access their education alongside their peers that otherwise um, perhaps would not be able to do so without her support. And this is a, a huge, huge, um, it's a huge contribution to the lives of these students because they are able to receive that education in the regular ed setting. They do extremely well. They just need that extra layer of support and Wendy is, provides that every day and does it very, very well. So thank you, Wendy, for that very much. Do you want to come up too? Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to have worked with these wonderful teachers alongside of the best. Um, seen many kids come and go, grow up, have more kids, and um, it's just been a pleasure. It hasn't been a work. It hasn't been a job. It's been a real pleasure. So thank you. So now is a good point where we can take a, a pause and, and celebrate um, for 10, 15 minutes the, um, our wonderful retirees. Thank you, everybody. We'll commence in 10, 15 minutes.
much. So we didn't have a whole lot of time. Okay. All right. So we're going to pick up next and start with um, a, a presentation from Jonathan Werner right, of the district's Common Sense Education Certification. Good evening. Um, this is Cape's newest resident, Amanda Kazaka, one of her, our newest, who just told me that the lines are so long to vote that they had to stop them and copy ballots. Wow. So either we're in really good shape or really bad shape. Um, <laughs> good. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to talk. Um, Amanda and I always do better when we speak jointly because we think differently and it's helpful. She was kind enough to come along. So Howard, thank you very much for the opportunity. And if someone else is not taking the opportunity, thank you for serving in probably the least thank, the most thankless job in the state of Maine for the last two years in trying to fill enormous shoes and deal with a very unusual circumstance. So you've been fantastic and we've been very grateful as a faculty. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna do two things I never do. I'm gonna speak slowly and be brief. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. If I look kicked, I was kicked. Um, the slides that I'm going to show you, I'm going to zip through. They're really for your reference and for your questions. Um, but we are in two sections. First, just looking at what it means to be a common sense recognized district, and then what we're doing to be uh, a part of that going forward. So common sense media has now split into common sense media and common sense education. You may know Common Sense Media for its recommendations about apps and programming, um, films. Uh, Common Sense Education has always been a piece of it, but um, has split out to work specifically in the area of curriculum development um, and parental involvement in conversations about appropriate digital citizenship and technology use. So the criteria to become a district would be at least 50% of your schools meeting the Common Sense school criteria. Well, we're very fortunate to be as small and agile as we are, so by getting Pond Cove and the middle school certified, and then a little more intricate song and dance work on my part, um, we were able to get our district certified. So it means that we have demonstrated to parents our commitment to teaching students uh, about responsible ways to use their devices, and thinking about um, their safe choices, their appropriate choices, um, in an online community. And for Amanda and I, really also thinking about erasing the barriers that we might think of as existing between digital and analog. In other words, if you are a good digital citizen, you're a good citizen. If you're making good choices, you're making them both in real life and online. So increasingly, online is real life. And we feel like it's our responsibility to make that clear to kids, that those are not distinct um, spheres. So to be recognized um, as a district, we also needed to demonstrate that we were using their curriculum, which is superb. It is incredibly well researched. Um, we could teach it straight out of the box, and it would be phenomenal. Obviously, we've done tweaking, and we've figured out ways to blend pieces of it that seem the most relevant. But um, they provide a very clear series of uh, scope and sequence, as well as a really strong series of tools that are very engaging to kids, but also very clearly message driven. So it feels gamified to them, but it doesn't feel like um, empty. It feels very meaningful, and we have these great conversations coming out of them that we've been really delighted with in our work with fifth and sixth graders in particular. Um, this is the district's objectives and ben benchmarks that I submitted as part of the process, and just in case, like me, you have difficulty seeing. Um, the upper half of this we have completed. That is, we are now a already a certified district, and there's no reason why we won't continue to be in the coming years. Um, the way that the cert certification works, it looks at your percentage of students, not your percentage of teachers. So we are behind, and Amanda and I will talk about this in a second, in the lower, in the lower half, that is getting our teachers trained. But we have sufficient numbers in Pond Cove and the middle school to be able to get more than half of the students trained. 
Um, at Pond Cove, that is 100%. Tom and the crew there, Tom Chartre, and the people in guidance and uh, Cam Rosenblum have done a remarkable job and delivered the curriculum to every single student in Pond Cove, which in terms of coming into fifth and sixth grade is extraordinary. Um, Amanda has all the fifth graders currently and I have all the sixth graders, so we're at 100% in those two areas. And between us, we've also had all the seventh and eighth graders, but they haven't had the curriculum this year because we don't have direct instruction with them. So we've taken them through the curriculum in past years, so they've had it, but in terms of keeping certified, we're looking at ways to reach um, those classrooms uh, for direct instruction, and the best way to do that is to get more teachers certified and not to have the two of us bearing the burden of doing that. Um, so where are we at the moment? Um, as examples, this is what it looks like when you're certified. You get a delightful badge to go at the bottom of your email. Um, and so we are both certified, meaning we can deliver the curriculum with um, the imprimatur of um, common Sense Education. There are several other people in our building and in Pond Cove as well, and sufficient, as I said, to be able to offer it uh, to more than 50% of the students in both of those this year. Um, Pond Cove has been recognized, and this is from my application on their behalf. Um, we're in constant discussions with teachers, students, and families about the best ways to maximize the benefits of educational technology while minimizing its distractions, misuse, and overuse. From the middle school's application, um, more than these events themselves, that is moments where we've had opportunities to engage with families um, in small and larger events, um, and the corresponding lessons in our fifth through eighth grade classrooms, we've created conversations that simply were not happening that now extend into our families' homes and online lives. And really at the core of common sense education is that idea that we as a district cannot carry the burden alone and that we need to be giving students a, a consistent message in their homes and in our classrooms that says this is as much a part of your life as anything else is, your digital life, and as a result you need to think about it just as carefully, if not more so, than what you're doing day to day in a classroom or at home. And finally, from the district's application, um, the, so in terms of timeline, first I applied for Pond Cove and Cape Elizabeth Middle School. Those got through at the same time. Once we had those, then I was able to submit on behalf of the district. Um, this is from our district technology plan again, which I shared with Common Sense Education, and they um, specifically highlighted how impressed they were that we had uh, such a clear document providing this. But Amanda and I both noticed that it is the first area where she and I have the most work to do. Um, and we will do this with uh, faculty and staff for 2018-19. We have people in each building who can help us with it. And giving the uh, tools that are available already, getting those into the hands of the appropriate people. It's really not um, a philosophical difference. It's just getting the mechanics worked out. Um, Jeff Shedd and I had a great conversation about a way to use the one-to-one -one iPads in the high school to do that. It will be very easy to do through the advisory program, and we think we can develop some pretty um, robust programming for the middle school that will reach the seventh and eighth graders as well. And as I said, K through six is already taken care of in the existing structures. So, I will ask Amanda to talk a little bit about any of these she chooses. Um, these are highlights from things that we've recently done or been working on or uh, looking forward to doing, and then we'd love to take any questions you have. Well, actually, before I do, I have a feeling that we that was our three minutes. Indeed. Um, so, how about we take questions first, and then if we need some examples, we'll just, we'll just keep that up there to look at. Questions about how the program was integrated, about the certification process. So I have a couple of questions. And yep. This is sort of more 10,000 foot view. So one, one of the things that, I, first of all, I'm really interested and think this is really important uh, in our schools. Um, I have always felt that particularly when we turn over powerful tools to our kids, whether that's uh, an ax in Boy Scouts, whether that's a car in driver's training, um, it needs to come with uh, instruction on how to use that safely and responsibly, and I don't think technology is any different than that. Um, one of the things that goes along with that being a citizenship, though, is sort of a, a clear set of values um, and that everybody sort of buys into. And with cars and axes and other things like that, those are really pretty well known, and they're well known by everybody, so you can get a, 
a group and community sense of how you should be behaving that re is reinforcing. And is there sort of a set of those behaviors that are and expectations that are delineated for people so we all know them? And then sort of the corollary question to that is, is there any thoughts about <clears throat> bringing parents in and other community members into the picture? Because I know from my own experience, again, drawing this sort of car analogy, um, you may learn the right habits in your driver's training class, but when you drive with a parent who doesn't do that, you pick up bad habits. Um, and <laughs> uh, it, it's I think it's really helpful, and parents, particularly in this new area, don't have the tools or instruction to be able to do that and to set the proper expectation of themselves and of their kids. So that's my sort of my questions is, are those values sort of delineated and can, is there a thought about how you expand that to the broader community so you can get that community reinforcement? That, that's a really good analogy. Um, <laughs> um, I think that's a really good analogy to keep in mind. Um, I do believe, um, well, so there are a few slides back of the chart that showed the, um, the benchmarks. That came from our technology plan, correct? Mm -hmm. So we know that at the admin level, there are a lot of conversations about how to make sure that we have a community set of values around everything we do, but specifically around technology integration. Um, this district has committed a lot of time and resources and money um, to developing such a strong technology program here. Um, and we absolutely need to make sure that we're doing, um, that we're building the, the foundation as we build the resources that we're building the foundation to really make it um, a strong program. Um, I believe that the values are there. They're in our schools, they're, they're in our teacher meetings, they're in our conversations. Um, I have not yet seen everything pulled together into, you know, a document, let's say, but even just behind you, the, the Cape mission, the, there are pieces, there are pieces of our values all over, but it, it would be perhaps, um, I, I want to point out, it's, I think it's really remarkable that we earned this in, in the first year. This was a lot to do. Um, and I don't, I don't know if Jonathan said it enough, this is, we're the first district in Maine to accomplish this, which is pretty amazing, um, knowing that there are hundreds and hundreds of certified, um, common sense media certified teachers in Maine. Um, so I think that it's remarkable that we've accomplished so much in this first year, and as we move on to the next year and the third year, um, that having that set of values is, as a, um, you know, a more established in, endorsed and, you know, uh, what's the word, adopted mm -hmm. uh, foundation so, would be a good idea. So, so pl please don't take my questions as, uh, as a criticism at all. I'm very, uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I, I'm, I make them because I actually think it is really important and, and, and have a vision of it being something that's really important and strong and broader. And I, I feel like this is a great place to start but I think if you have a, a vision of, of having it be as strong as everyone knows you yeah. pass on the left and not on the right, right, that you keep your hands at 10 and 2, and, sort of, and just sort of, in other words, a set of, and, and a set of guiding principles about how you behave that, ever, that is really common and really clear. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the, those may not be the perfect analogies, but mm -hmm. I think it's heading in a direction Absolutely. that will, can really pay yeah. long run dividends. And, and I will say that another um, area of our, um, our, our parent events. Um, you, not to get too much into the details of it, but to become certified, there are different um, ways that, you know, benchmarks that you as an individual educator must meet to become certified. And one of the things you have to do is show that you are making an effort to reach out to parents um, and share the curriculum. And I think that there's a lot more that we could do. Um, Jonathan and I have both tried having book talks and parent nights and things like that, and, and we could use help um, developing that, that component of the program as well. It's a challenge to, to have evening events in, in, such, in this district. It's very difficult to, to add things to the calendar, but I think it's, it's worthwhile and um, perhaps um, with the school board support and admin support, we could get the word out on some really important parent events upcoming. Um, I just pulled this up because it, another way to think about the response to your question is that um, common sense education has made a very clear 
um, value of having opening that conversation with parents. And as I said, they have laid out some very specific um, benchmarks and as you can see in this scope and sequence. So on the left hand side are the areas that common sense education covers. So our students are talking about all those things. But if your families, our families knew to have those conversations and questions, then the reciprocal experience would be wonderful because they would come back and um, I had a parent event the other night and a student came to me and said, my mom wants me to ask you this. And the question was a little <laughs> more complicated than I wanted to get into with a fifth grader. So like, I'm gonna talk to mom, but it was great because kid carried the message that he and mom had been talking about it. And if we had that happening more, I think we would um, stand out even more significantly because I think the districts where this has created the most difficulty and where it ends up in the headlines is where there isn't that, that open conversation. So anything we can do um, to make this transparent uh, we both, uh, Amanda introduced it to me, and I couldn't imagine doing a better job at a national level of standardizing the conversation and giving us expectations. Um, where, where we next need to move is getting that message out to others. So uh, I'll just add, add briefly. I know for one, for myself as a parent, I'm hungry for standards to which to work with yep. my children on. And I don't feel like I have them currently. So I mean, they're sort of, yeah. Evolving and mushy. Okay. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Other uh, questions? Just to leave you with this quick image, which is the, oh yeah, sorry, just the shift. Um, as a tiny example, um, common sense education asks you to think about not your footprint, that is something that walks, washes away or disappears, but your digital tattoo that you're stuck with. And getting kids just that mental shift is enormous as a baseline. And that's the kind of thing that they've really thought through. They have everything from parent organized conversations, you know, here are examples to talk about. So you're not saying to your kid, like, why did you do that? You can talk about like hypothetical Johnny and his poor choices, um, poor Johnny. And the sense of, of giving you the tools that you need to have those conversations. And I think the clearest message they have is there is no answer, there's only more conversation. Elizabeth, did you have a question? I didn't have a question so much as a suggestion. Um, I feel like Tom Chaltre has done a really nice job of kind of getting, um, it, it, whether it's Coder Express or other technology nights, kind of into the ethos of Pond Cove. And, and they're kid driven, but they're also, they're sort of, they have now become like you expected, it's coming on the schedule. And there, so if you all can find a way just to make it yeah. become that, okay, this is, it's always blah, blah night, and you know it's coming, it's, it's like Coder Express night or something. And just, you know, as opposed to, you know, um, just trying to find that date, and, and oh my gosh, there are the chorus concerts, and there are the sports games, or whatever. Yeah. You know, um, allow yourselves to believe that you belong on the schedule, and that you <laughs> are, you know, that, that you're that annual, same thing, and then, and then it becomes part of the fabric of the school community for those parent nights. Congratulations on certification, and thank you so much for can bringing this. Yeah. Can I also make one other suggestion? Is that um, my son in ninth grade in health class, this is a little different, but this might benefit your program as well, had an assignment, and he came home, and he had to interview me. And it was about drugs and alcohol. And um, we had had those conversations before. But if we hadn't, it was a stimulus for me to say, OK, this is what I think. OK, this is how I feel about it. And, it, and, it, and he had to record it and give it to his teacher and stuff. Um, so that could be a way to get the information across. You know, somehow give it an assignment that you have to go home and interview your parent. And you kind of force the conversation. I thought it was really powerful. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, I, I don't want to take up any more time, but it, it's reminding me that there are a lot of resources like um, that come with the lessons with Common Sense Media or Common Sense Education that have a parent component to it. So I know um, fifth graders, I sent home a, my media log at the beginning of the semester, and I didn't get all of them back, but it was to sort of stimulate that conversation. Mm -hmm. like, how much time do you really spend using media? And, you know, I put it in front of school so the parent might be like, what is that, my media log? <laughs> Yeah. But you're right, anything that gets that conversation, gets it front of our vocabulary, is really important. Thank you. We have obviously a lot more work to do, but we'll Wait, 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 wait. Don't need to be so hopeless. I just had one comment. I just. <laughs>
Well done on the certification. I think that can't be un understated, and I think that's something that could be used to sort of, as a district, we should be proud of it, and sort of we want to be that district that was there first and continue that. That's great. Thank you. So, thank you so, much. so I, I just would also want to just um, thank both of you for the effort and time that went into the, making the application. I, I know it was no small feat, and I've heard from a number of people uh, at a tall fee, yes, <laughs> right. Uh, I've heard from, from Noel, our director of technology, that it's very, very impressive what you've accomplished. And I've heard it from other people, um, um, Andrea uh, Fuller is an example. Others are saying this is a big deal. Um, and, and so I guess I, I, I'm just really concerned that this isn't a flash in the pan, that this has um, staying power. And what would that take besides um, administrative backing and support? What else is going to be required to really keep this in front of us so that it becomes uh, established and, and fine-tuned here? Uh, that's a question. You don't need to answer tonight, but... We're, we're thinking about it. Okay. 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 In, 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 the simplest answer is to get it out of our hands. Yeah. And then to as many because exactly. we're the tech people, right? right. Like, oh, they'll take care of it. No, that's exactly the opposite <laughs> right. of what we want. Right. Okay. You know, we on so be, many levels. We want to be the uh, first adopters and then right. bring right. a lot of other teachers along. Okay. And just just one last thing. I don't know if everybody knows this and. I'm, at, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact title of you being the state director of libraries. <laughs> or is that what it's called? Oh, wait, that would be a title. You, yeah, um, our new I, governor. I was recently, uh, <laughs> I do that too. Okay. Actually, that's funny you say that what, because we're having our big um, library, school library event at hopefully at the DOE next spring to be right in their faces. Um, but uh, yeah, I just recently began my term as the president of the Maine Association of School Libraries. That's a pretty big deal. Um, I served two years as the president-elect and now I start as president. Yeah. Congratulations. Congrats. Thank you, thank you. Thank you both right, thank very you. much for tonight. Thank you for your time. And next on the agenda, we have um, Jennifer Brooking presenting um, the topic of Cape Special Education Alliance. Good evening. I have some. Okay. Hello. Um, like you said, I'm Jen Brooking. I'm the facilitator of the Cape Elizabeth Special Education Alliance. The materials I've passed to you is a copy of our mission and goals and objectives, our meeting schedule for the next school year, we meet monthly, okay. and our group contact information. Um, why I'm here tonight is I am hoping that our group can become recognized as an official parent organization in the school district. And I've written a little thing about um, why that's important. Um, although we have been meeting as a group for over three years, um, so that's what I was saying, um, that I'm hoping that our group can be recognized. Sorry, I had the page turned to the wrong side. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Um, three years ago, our group started as an angry group of parents as most powerful groups are started. But we have grown to be a group of parents, educators, and administrators that work together and have a positive collaborative relationship. Uh, Director of Special Services, Jessica Clark, sent our group a letter of support, which I have forwarded to you all in full. I just did it like 15 minutes ago, so if you haven't read it, that's okay. Um, but I wanted to read the following words from her letter here tonight. Um, so these are um, Jessica Clark's words. I have found the collective knowledge and balance that this group offers to be a great forum for discussing informal special education topics. Participants varied, but always included parents, staff members, and administrators. As someone who thrives on watching others find their voice, it was clear that this group had a purpose beyond a place 
to gather and talk about the law. It really was just wonderful to see staff, parents, and other community members gathered together in discussion of opportunities and knowledge. This was certainly nothing that I had experienced before in any of the school districts that I had consulted in or previously worked for. The group has been able to host presentations by Cape Elizabeth speech and language pathologists where strategies were offered to help parents during longer break periods over the school year. Presenter from Strive shared information regarding transitions, I think I lost my mic, transitions after high school, it's okay I have a loud voice. Um, case management and planning for services beyond what a public school is able to provide. Representatives from state agencies attended and offered information through a presentation as well as providing many resources for parents and staff to use. Some parents attended trainings offered in the practices of verbal de-escalation used by our own professional staff so that similar language and philosophies would be shared and understood in school and in the home. Other topics discussed were technology and transportation. There hasn't been a topic that this group has dismissed as long as it is relevant to our population. I really think that the now newly, na newly named Cape C group is doing positive things in Cape Elizabeth. Parents of all learners can come and listen or feel free to speak. Information is shared that is relevant to particular areas of interest or concern, and all parties are able to hear the same messages. This group has been a great support for our staff in getting to know families outside of the school day and outside of IEP meetings, which has helped to build a bridge of understanding and to soften the adversarial relationships we sometimes find ourselves in through our delicate IEP process. I have valued my responsibilities within this group and know that this outlet has given parents and staff an opportunity to learn together. Um, <clears throat> at our last meeting, we voted to become an alliance as we feel this better reflects our direction, our mission, and goals. We are hoping becoming an official organization of the district will help more of the school community aware of our group, become involved, and open opportunities to more resources. And so that's why I'm here tonight. And any questions um, are definitely welcome. You could just say yes. <laughs> It's a matter of a vote, right? It's just, it's just. I, I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I do. I think, um, like any any sub, you know, any um, parent group, you know, just to, and I'm, I'm sure you didn't say it, but I'm sure you have this in the forefront of your mind that it will be really important as you move forward to coordinate with the director of special education, especially in terms of if any money raised, um, just like we do with C to make yeah. sure of certain things. But I, I absolutely, think it's a wonderful, absolutely, a wonderful asset, and it's a great idea. And um, we really would like to start doing some fundraising. Um, just last week, our group um, organized um, some treats for each of the school's special ed staff. Um, so, um, if they were really um, hyped up on sugar, we apologize. Um, but that was a really nice thing for our, our group to do. But that, I mean, that just came right out of our own pockets. So, which, you know, that's okay. But um, to be able to fundraise and to be able to have speakers come in um, that, you know, they, there are speakers that do cost money. And um, right now, pretty much what we've been doing is we have been utilizing school resources or um, free organizations like Maine Parent Federation. Um, but those resources are pretty slim too, so. Right. Yeah, so I think you being- my blessing, I, I think yeah. it's a wonderful idea okay. and an asset for, for all parents in the community. Okay, so we have permission to use the Cape Elizabeth name then. Okay. Well, you, I think that you can in the way that other groups say that we're the Cape Elizabeth dry cleaners or whatever. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that well, you are. Well, we had discussed you, you and I, not, Howard, you're, about. You are, are not part of yeah. the school district and you can't use our tax code. Yeah. I mean, it's, but absolutely, if you want to say that you are, uh, I think you're using uh, Cape C, mm -hmm. I think that that's absolutely appropriate. Okay. This board, though, is not bringing you under wings, so to speak. You're a, a, a uh, 
uh, and, and uh, a group of well-intended community advocates and volunteers supporting children and families with children with special needs. And I think what you're hearing from the board members is good for you and congratulations, but it, it ends at that point. Okay. In the same way like Cape Elizabeth High School Parents Association. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, they have their own books, they have their own accounts, they have their, right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So I'm here to make you aware of a report that I have been working on with a great group of people, including two school, school board members. Um, it's called the Comprehensive Needs Assessment and Consolidated Plan. Um, and the nature of the name tells you probably originated with the state, which yes, it did. Um, it's a, a state requirement that we complete this plan uh, once every five years. Um, it's a new requirement resulting from the passage of the Every Student Succeeds Act. Um, Often when we're given these mandates, there's a temptation to say, oh my gosh, let's just cross this off the list. And I admit that I've occasionally thought that, but really um, the nature of the, of the report is such that I think it's an opportunity for us, an invitation to engage in the first part of that five word phrase, a comprehensive needs assessment. So we're asked to gather a lot of data, attendance data, uh, test score data, um, student disciplinary data, uh, climate and culture surveys, et cetera. And to gather all of that data together in one place and then to think about the story that that data is telling us and, and then what we can learn from that data and, and how we can use that data to set goals for ourselves as a district going forward. Um, so I've been joined in this work, um, as I mentioned, two school board members and then um, administrators, teachers, we've met three times. Uh, formally, there have been a lot of informal meetings as well. And um, a, a draft is going to be uh, emailed to staff and to the school board next week and posted on the district's website. And I'm really hoping that people will take the time to read it and to offer feedback. We'd like to incorporate that feedback as much as possible before shipping it off to the state by July 1st. So, and <clears throat> any questions about what we're doing or? Okay, so you're, just, are you committing to read it? Just, just, one. <laughs> just, just one question. As you've already sort of had a chance to gather and review the data, um, in the process of doing that, <clears throat> Um, was there any types of data or categories of data where you feel like we can actually do, where we have holes in what we were able to gather, holes that, are, are, that, that tell us about ourselves? And, and if so, will that be a part of the overall report in terms of where, because we've done the data gathering, sometimes you say, oh, I've got these things and boy, I don't have this piece here. We don't keep, we haven't done that on a consistent basis. We have, right. The data is not that good or mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so you've already sort of come that far. That's that was piece of the only thing I would ask. I, I think, yes, um, <coughs> that's a great question. And uh, our quantitative data is very up to date. Um, I mean, we're required to maintain that um, and we would in any case, but I think we've all observed that our qualitative data, so the surveys, for example, are now a couple of years old and so it's worth bringing those back. Um, so, and certainly there's been talk about like a, a recent graduate survey, um, uh, f formalizing that process as well. Um, so yes. So, so will there be, is there a section or will there be a section on sort of data sources going, um, oh, currently and going forward absolutely. in the report? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And also even though it's, a, we're only required to do this every five years, it's expected and I think we would want to every year revisit and to see how we're doing. Um, okay. so. So, but I think there's going to be some really good learning. We were just talking um, this morning in an in a administrative team meeting about um, the attendance data. And I think, I think that's going to be, is going to emerge as an, as an area for growth for us. So, more to come, but again, something for you to look forward to reading next week. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
it's it, no. I think you you're, you're you're being a bit sarcastic, but I think it's <laughs> no. Well, uh, only who who wants to read a thirty page report? But yes, but it's thought provoking. Absolutely, and and you're right. It's going to illuminate certain things that you know, like John just pointed out, that maybe we, we could do better to gain mm -hmm. more more mm -hmm. data. Um, you know, and certainly in our last discussion, the idea of uh, putting out eventually a new climate and culture survey um, to teachers, to parents and families, you know, that alone um, was, you know, it's like, just, oh, okay, good, it's time to do it again. But there's many things, I think, that if you do take the time to, to go through it, um, it's thought-provoking. So thank you, Kathy. Yeah. To, to be clear, the sarcasm is only about knowing how busy we all are, yeah, and so yeah. really, that's just like one more thing to put on your plate. But I, I, th I think, again, it, it is an opportunity for us to reflect and to get better. It feels exciting to have, for me anyway, it's exciting and, and interesting to, to think about gathering all the data sources that we have and really looking at everything and reflecting. So I'm excited. I'll read the report. All right. so, so one additional question, because it's sort of come up in the broader context of here we sit on June 12th. Um, are there other, will, uh, are there any other sort of other district, other school districts, benchmarks that we are be looking to to understand how we're doing and what we're doing in this type of a report. So, so it's going to tell us about ourselves. Yes. Um, but uh, is it going to sort of is it will it have a comparative instructive quality? Well, I think it can because these are all public documents, and so we could familiarize ourselves with other districts' reports. Um, but that's not. What you're asking for in a narrow way is not a part of the report, right. but it and, could and be a direction for us going and forward. It, it's not something that's commonly done currently, it sounds no. like. No. All right, thank you very much. All, all I can say to that, if I, if I understood the question, if you don't mind, is if you're, if you're suggesting that maybe we would look at other school districts on, on, comparable, uh, for, on certain questions to see where we align, I just hope that you would um, uh, get out of the pattern I see here of always comparing ourselves with Yarmouth and Falmouth and Cumberland and I don't know who else, but look outside of that circle of our neighbors when they're lovely schools and they do, and we can learn from them. I don't mean that we uh, uh, shouldn't look, but I just, I just see so often that seems to be our range of comparison. And I, I, I was intrigued tonight to hear. Uh, Dr. Efron say that he went down to Brookline. I like to look at what Brookline's doing. That's uh, uh, an example of what I mean. Looking outside of the area, looking outside of the state, find districts uh, that we know. I'll, I'll give you one that I used to always look at uh, was Princeton uh, High School when I was in high school business. I, I, I mean, there are schools that just and Mr. Shedd knows and are the principals, you all know, well, let's look at um, a broader range of comparisons is the point. So. I, I couldn't agree more. Cape Elizabeth likes to compare itself often, nationally, regionally, on, on, on many different aspects, but then when it comes to certain other things, we only look down the block. So absolutely, and, I, and I, this sounds like a, this is a national program based on the ESSA law, which is national, so it would actually potentially provide a basis for looking quite far afield. Right. Good question. Uh, will the data be available in a static format only, that an output of report or someone else, someone else analyzed it, or will it be available in a raw format so that we can do our own analysis on it? Static. Then good luck reading it. Because it's other, other people's opinion or other people's analysis of it, right? You cannot manipulate it unless we have the data to see what you want to get out of it. Right. It's I mean, giving a number, but you can't compare or cross reference the numbers either. So, that ideally, at some point, we should have that data digitally so we can do our own analysis as well. It's a great suggestion. Um, yes. Uh, there's been a lot of frustration expressed that, in fact, the state um, wants us to submit this as a hard copy rather than electronically, even though to answer many of the questions, many of the prompts, we would link um, documents that we've been working on. So 
it's the first year. I don't know. Okay. Hopefully, yes. That's 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 a goal so, for okay. them. So right now it's you're for them to So right now you're filling the box and yes. filing a standard a report. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Next on the agenda are leadership team updates. I'm not sure who is going to do this, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll provide the report okay. on teacher evaluation plan. Um, though anybody should please feel to join in. Um, we, you, you know that the district um, committed a lot of energy and time to developing a plan, I think maybe three or four years ago. Um, I mean, a lot of time and energy went into the plan. And then starting last year, we made a dry run at, at the plan. And this year, it's, um, I think we would say it's alive and, and, and doing well. But um, we have been working off of the guidelines that were set um, and approved by the state and the school board in terms of the frequent number, the, the number of visits that we would assure a, a teacher either on continuing contract or probationary. And those go back to the initial study that said that we would um, provide 10 classroom visits, so-called mini visits, um, to probationary teachers each year, and I believe it was um, uh, 15 visits, to, uh, 15 or 20, 20 to teachers on continuing contract over a period of three years. And we are, in all of our schools, not um, achieving that, uh, um, that, that standard. Um, and I've, I've mentioned that to you last year, I mentioned it to you this year. We just, and everyone's trying, but, um, and part of it is I think we have to try harder and get better at this and more proficient. And I think that will increase the, the, the frequency of the visits. But we also are, are, are doubting that those numbers are um, achieved, totally achievable in the near future. And what it's causing is disappointment <coughs> on the part of teachers that they aren't seeing the visits that they felt that they could plan on. And it's causing administrators frustration to, in a sense, to, um, to fail at meeting that. I mean, for, and no one's enjoying this, um, the way that it's working out right now. So recently we had an interesting uh, visit. Some of you will know her, um, Julie Nickerson, used to be, I believe, the assistant principal at Pond Cove currently one of the principals in Freeport. And she came in to just, just talk with us, uh, the teachers on the, on the team, as well as, as the administrators, about what she's experiencing in Freeport. And we, meaning the, our committee, um, after she left, felt that what they're doing in Freeport feels much more attainable, manageable, and uh, and what, what, what they're doing in Freeport is they're guaranteeing a range of between six and eight as opposed to our 10 for probationary. And they're guaranteeing teachers on continuing contract between four and five. If they can do more, they will, but, but they're saying that you can go to the bank on this one. We're, we're gonna get in six to eight or four to five and per year. Four to five is per year, not over per year. Per year, not, right, not over the three years, just every year. And, and that in Freeport, they have a minimum of two peer observations required every year. Um, and it could go either way. You could go visit a, a friend's classroom, not necessarily a friend, but a peer's classroom, or he or she could come to yours. It doesn't matter. Being, in another, being together with another teacher and observing and talking about the, the lesson. So we just want you to know that that's what's going on in terms of what our, our conversation. Um, our committee wants to sit down and talk about all of this with Donna Wolfram when she arrives. And if she feels that, if, she, if she's comfortable with what we're gonna call the Freeport model, you may be hearing from her in the fall that she would like to go forward um, and make then a, a, a move to adjust our plan. 
the, the way that would work would be that it would go to the Department of Ed first. We know it would be approved because they approve reports. And then it would come to you to see if it has your blessing. But if you find this to be too far out of step with um, your thinking or your hopes, then there's plenty of time. This is not going to be anything that happens without your knowledge and support all the way through. But th this seems, the committee, again, made up of teachers and administrators felt that what they want more than anything is something that can be accomplished and everyone can, in the end, feel they got out of it what they needed. Uh, right now, that's not the case. So I just want you to be aware of um, what could be a proposal to adjust the plan. Elizabeth? I really appreciate the committee putting this kind of deep thought and giving this kind of attention to it. Um, I don't think that, uh, I for one, and I'm sure the board does not want teachers and administrators to um, just be bumping up against failure and frustration all the time. And so I commend everybody for bringing in an outside perspective and thinking and looking at um, a, a slight modification that might be, you know, reasonable and still be meaningful because right. meaningful is what matters. It, it is. So I thank everybody for working on this. And yeah. you know, thank at you. first blush, the, it sounds great. The other thing I would say that has been interesting is that the feedback the, this year, the committee surveyed all of our teachers. The teachers love meeting with their administrators and talking about the lesson. They just have they've been. It's been incredibly enjoyable, and the administrators are saying the same thing, that um, the, the, the conversation that happens, you know, in, in Freeport, it happens within, I think, 24 hours. It's like, you don't put us off for a week. But that, everyone's always, all along, has said the hope here, among other things, is to build better understanding and communication and appreciation in, in the building. And um, so, the good news is the meetings that there are taking place have been very much appreciated. Could I just ask, do, um, the, are we in the model that we're presently using, um, do we have peer observations or would that be a new? We, we, we do and I can't guarantee, I think it's one per cycle, right? One per year, one per cycle. One per year. One per year. And again, Freeport would be to double that. No, I, I thank everyone for the, I mean, it sounds like a lot of year after year effort, and I think um, continued effort to get something that's maybe going to work um, is great. I, I, I appreciate everyone's time and effort and willingness to keep looking at it to figure out what, what would work effectively. Yep. Thank you. I, I'm glad to see that um, the reduction is not you know, so different from what original plan was because that's part of the beauty of the plan is I the know. frequency. So six, I know. six to eight, if that's the range, I think, um, or four to five, I, I think those are still really reasonable mm -hmm. um, numbers to shoot for. And I, yep. I would love to never see it go lower than that, but thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. So, I, I just added, you know, I would say with all speed, I think part of the challenge has been getting something that we can all implement so that then we can then make assessments once we've really got it implemented. And that's the challenge. And we're now copying off the paper of someone who's doing it. And that's always the best way to go. We don't, we don't need to be, so as fast as we can get it done, the fat, great. Yep. Go fast. Yep. That's what I say. <laughs> Thank you. So Howard, um, principals are next. business manager. Um, well, about, about business manager, um, Catherine went home ill. Okay. And um, I do have her manifest to be signed tonight later on by you, but she's uh, uh, unfortunately uh, left early. Okay. All right. And do the principals want to speak at all? Or? I'm not sure if there's. <laughs> it's, if one does, they all are going to feel. <laughs> You don't want no, to they don't want to talk. Yeah. <laughs> I can see it in their faces. Just. <laughs> and, and, and Jacob Wood's gone home, Howard, so you're out of luck. <laughs> I was going to say, the principal's already spoken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the true principal has spoken. <laughs> okay. All right, so now it's your turn, Howard. Superintendent's report. Oh, okay. I mean, I'm dying to speak. 
<laughs> and like Dr. Efron, I got a lot to say. <laughs> He's retired. I guess you're retired right. too. You're leaving. Right. So, so uh, first of all, I want to report that my wife's in the audience. Um, and so Nancy came down for my last board meeting and um, I want to acknowledge that she's here tonight. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, we need to thank her. Yes. <laughs> Yay, thank you, whatever. <laughs> but thank her. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, Aaron, I believe it's pronounced Tosi, uh, will be stepping in as the administrative assistant. She is replacing um, Andrea. Um, she was a, a, a picked, apparently, a very f flattering recommendations and references um, coming from Chevres High School. And um, she will be here the last week of June to spend some time with, uh, with Andrea, and then she'll be here full-time as of the 1st of July. Okay. So uh, it's, it's T-O-S-I is her name, E-R-I-N, Erin Tosi, or how you would pronounce that. Um, but we're, we're, everyone's very excited about her coming in. Um, I, I have to say, next in line, of course, is just how much I've appreciated uh, Andrea. You, you know that, uh, I've said it several times. I mean, seriously, every now and then, I, a, a brilliant thought comes to my mind, and I rush out, and I mention it, and almost always, Andrew says, oh, Howard, I've already taken care of that. <laughs> I mean, it's just like, she's always ahead of me. She's got it figured out, thinking uh, it's all taken care of. I mean, it's, it's not, I go back in my office and <laughs> close the door. And, <laughs> uh, and so, but she, she's worked with a number of school boards and superintendents here, and she's a very quiet person, but she is so smart and efficient and, and humble. You know, she's just, um, it's just been a treat working with her, and I know you feel like I do, that um, we're lucky that she's staying with us in a new role, um, but um, it's, it, she certainly has made my time here um, much more, uh, organized and successful, and I really appreciate her. Um, on the 31st of May, PASS had their, their, their um, I think they're calling it a celebration rather than graduation. I, I know that Mr. Shedd and I were there. Um, it, it, it was very enjoyable, uh, a lively, large event, and we had students, uh, a number of students that earned their credentials and licenses and certificates, whatever they're called, in various vocational fields. And it was just, it was enjoyable um, and quite impressive, to say the least. Um, let's see, the Festival of Curiosity, um, oh my goodness. I, I went again this year and um, it was incredibly impressive. All of the people in the larger community showing up and um, offering their interest in, in professional experiences. I mean, we had people that were talking about brain surgery in one room and how to lay bricks uh, in another room. I mean, it's the full range of so many things going on. And st the students were really high energy involved. And our teachers took on a, the role of trying to kind of just keeping it moving and respectful and organized. And they did that, did a really good job at that. But it was just a nice, nice change to the regular pattern of, of school and piques the curiosity uh, for students about any number of things that could end up being uh, a, a, a college uh, major perhaps or a vocation. You have no idea. The students were just going, you mean people actually do this? Or I mean, they, they just, it was just really wonderful. And again, primarily organized by community members with it, and then with the administration and the teachers working with them in concert, pulling off a very exciting day for the kids. And I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, let's see. This last week, I met with Troy and Jason and Peter and Robin about um, how to organize the, the lunch program for next school year. 
I, I bring it up only because I just want to remind everybody that that situation is um, problematic. Um, remember someone said that at our meeting that we're putting around 1,100 kids through that, 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 that room in less than two hours every day to, fe to feed them and, and eat and move them out. I mean, 1,100 every day of the week, two hours. It's, it's, it's um, I mean, I think that serving that many students in two hours in, in, a, in a different setting is different. I'm talking about that setting, that kitchen and that serving area. So I just really hope that sooner than later, that along with a number of other obvious concerns are going to get addressed in a school renovation project. Um, the Thompson family and CIF are, are going to met with a number of us two, more, two additional times recently uh, about the whole focus on student mental health. And I met today with, with Ellen Jordan from CIF, and they will be providing me, perhaps tomorrow or the next day, a list of ideas that came, people came up with in our schools that they think they can support financially this next school year. So once I know what that list is, I'll share it with you. But uh, some interesting ideas came up, um, all generated primarily from, from, from teachers and social workers and nurses um, and some of those, I think, are going to get su supported this next year. It's very, very nice. Um, the interviews for special education director um, are, are a, a, a new round of new candidates is being set for this Friday, June fifteenth. Donna Wolfham will be here to lead that those interviews, with the hope of having some people. Eight people are being interviewed, as I understand it short, quick interviews with the hope of bringing back a smaller number, obviously, the following Friday, the 22nd, to um, narrow it down to a smaller group to keep working to find a, a good replacement who hopefully would be able to be here sometime in, in, in July. Um, I also today received word from Sarah Harrington, who is, as you uh, know, um, just an outstanding high school social studies teacher, she has is, is submitted a letter of resignation. And um, I, I'm really sorry to see her leave and, and thank her uh, for the number of years that she has been here, really doing outstanding teaching and, 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 and leading in terms of instructional refinement and curriculum work at the high school. It's just, um, she'll, be, she'll be missed. Um, I told her I would only accept her resignation if her family gave me the name of trout fishing streams in Montana. She's from Montana. <laughs> I've got the list. Um, so she gets to resign. Um, let's see. Um, school nurse Erin Taylor was here last night and met with uh, town council. They wanted to be sure that they understood the idea of raising funds to um, improve the playground at Pond Cove. It's part of their, I think, their, their charter. And she, and she did get um, their encouragement last night, so she's received that um, encouragement from both the school board now and town council. That's very good. And so now the work begins of trying to figure out how to raise money to complete that project. Again, an overdue project. Um, and I would also say that Aaron's opinion is that Part of the problem there is a safety concern, uh, the number of injuries on the playground. Um, I, I guess that I also want to just next say that, and, and, and the last thing I think I'm going to say is just that um, I, I, I see a very, very bright future for Cape Elizabeth schools. I think that it's exciting. You've got a new superintendent coming in who you, you picked with a lot of enthusiasm from a broad uh, interview committee. She'll be showing up shortly. Um, I, I I feel you've got a, a very, very talented and capable administrative team. Um, the, the teachers here are second to none that I've worked with, really. I mean, they're just, they're incredibly, incredibly strong faculty. Um, the students, I mean, <laughs> Um, this young man tonight was such, uh, so sweet, but um, the students at all of our schools are just 
um, special young people, very curious, polite in my opinion, uh, respectful. Um, the, you know, the young ladies that have been coming to our meetings all year long and talking about, I mean, just to watch them and their presence and vocabulary and, and, and uh, honesty, I mean, that reflects, I think, quite well the caliber of, of the student body. It's very impressive. Um, I had heard that the parents here are very difficult and demanding. I, um, that's hogwash and if, um, from my perspective. I found parents to be here to be clearly advocating for quality schools, but lovely, understanding, even when we don't agree on something, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not, it, it, it's, it's well received and we move on. But more often than not, we do agree and have been very patient and kind and respectful and welcoming. I mean, I just can't say enough good things about the place. Um, and I, I, about the school board, you know, I, I, um, you are a united group of people, different people, different ideas about a number of things, which is very healthy, but you're united and you're working as a team and you are clearly advocating for these children. I mean, there's no doubt you advocate for these kids and, the, and you have great respect for your teachers and administrators and schools, even schools as good as your schools can, can fall apart. I mean, almost in the, in the blink of an eye, seriously. And then it's very hard to rebuild them. But when a school board is, as, as you are, as stable and as good and playing the right role and advocating for education and its children, it helps everything else kind of come together. I mean, if you start falling apart, it all starts unraveling. And you have just done, a, I, you've been so good to work with. You, I mean, I just thoroughly enjoyed working for you and your honest feedback at times of, you know, offering some ideas that maybe I wasn't thinking of or maybe didn't agree with, but doing it in a very nice way. And I don't know, you've just been great to work for. I've. Um, it's really been an honor to work here, and it's a great way to end my career. I mean, that's when you know you've been it's just a treat of, of a board, and I thank you all very much. I'm done. You see this because your wife is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So moving on to new business. Um, may I have a motion for six A? I move we approve the collective bargaining agreement for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association Administrative Support Personnel and Education Technicians 1, dated July 1, 2018 to June 30th, 2021. I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, 6B, may I have a motion? I move we consider to approve the collective bargaining agreement for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association Educational Technicians 2 and Educational Technicians 3 dated July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2021. Second? I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Um, I have a motion for 6C. I move that we approve the collective bargaining agreement for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association bus drivers, custodian, food service, and maintenance mechanic dated July 1st, 2018 to June 30th, 2021. I have a second? Second. A second. Any discussion? I want to thank um, Elizabeth and Hope for their hard, hard work on this. Negotiations don't come up every year, but when they do, they are a lot of time and effort and require um, a certain sort of finesse. I think that we are really appreciative of both of you for possessing mm -hmm. and, and sharing and working on behalf of the whole district to mm -hmm. here, here. forth yep. contracts that are really strong and solid. So thank you both. Thank you. I, I second that. I think the work that they've done, the updates that they've given, uh, I'm very, I think we ended up with a uh, excellent contract. I think uh, everyone came out of it feeling good about it. I appreciate the work uh, both on behalf of the board and the representatives of the union. I think we're in a much better place now um, than we were when we, we started. Um, and 
look forward to continuing to work together. And thanks again for the really hard, diligent work of the negotiations committee mm -hmm. team. I was very impressed. Thanks. All those in favor? Next, moving on to item 6D, may I have a motion? I move we approve the planning time letter of intent between the school board and the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. Do we have a second? A second. Any discussion? Um, I think it would be a good idea just to briefly touch upon um, a little of the history. Back during um, teacher negotiations, the board was really made aware of the lack of planning time at Pond Cove in particular. And at that time, um, while we did not pursue putting anything into the contract, um, both parties agreed to um, bring it up in policy. And then when we got to policy, both parties kind of found like that wasn't a good fit either. And so instead we decided to pursue a letter of intent that would be um, put with the contract. And um, so that letter kind of preserves a little bit of the history, understanding of you know where we came from, what drove the letter, and then um, just kind of solidified everybody's agreement around the importance of planning time, which which means staffing and scheduling. That you know we prioritize that you know as equally important to in class time as far as student success. So that's where the letter came from. And we thank Wynn for working with us, and mm -hmm. um, Fran Vita Taylor, and Heather as well for those meetings. I don't want to say we, I. <laughs> thank you, everyone. I think this is really a smart and important um, step in the right direction. So thank you, everyone. Oh, that's right. All those in favor? Those two may be assigned in your time. Okay. Okay, next is um, item 6E. May I have a motion, please? I, we, I move to, uh, to approve the approval of the following job description student service coordination for winter school. Coordinated. Second. Any discussion? Oh. Um, so I wanted to. I want to talk about this a little bit more because I think I, at the previous meeting, my understanding is that this is a proposal for a job description for a new, a new professional position, it's a new title, and it would be hired in lieu of the social worker that we approved, the, the additional headcount of the social worker. Um, so I, I went to the, I went to look at what the social worker job description is, and my concern is that my concern is what we might be missing out on when we hired this role with this job description in place of the social worker. Um, and specifically, sort of when you look at the responsibilities. Well, first of all, it's, it's, it's a different title. So when we go to our budget in the future, in future years, we're going to have the budget, the title, Student Services Coordinator. And when future boards are looking at it, they're going to say, well, what's this? What's this professional staff? That's you? student services coordinator. It doesn't, I mean, social work is very clear what the role is, that's what we wanted to add to the headcount, that's what we approved in the budget, and now it's, it's something that's quite different, I believe. It has similar um, qualifications, but it then sort of goes in a different direction in terms of their, their responsibilities. So primarily, um, the student services coordinator has attendance monitor, it has some administrative tasks, it has communication, but the number one job um, duty of the social worker is provide, provide mental health services to students within the school setting. And my concern is that we had, we had community outreach looking, you know, we had, we had a need for an additional social worker, and my fear is that what we did was we took that job opening and it's become something I'm, I'm concerned that we're losing the social worker, and then in three years we're going to say, gosh, we'd really I'd love to have a social worker. Why don't we have that social worker? Because this person will be very busy doing these seven job responsibilities that don't include providing mental health services to the students. 
So I, sh I should have had that, you know, I, I, think, I, I wish I was able to bring, articulate that at the last meeting, but I don't think, I, I don't want to let, let the vote go by without us sort of delving into that issue, because in three years we're going to have this headcount, and I'm worried that we might have a, a contentious budget year, and we're going to have to justify what a student services coordinator is when, when we have the strong community support for social work. So maybe I just start. Um, I remember, uh, I'm glad you're, you're, you're raising this um, question now. Uh, what I remember is that early on in the budget cycle, we, meaning the administration, felt that one of the um, inconsistencies, a, a, a hole in our staffing, was that the middle school, they had the least amount of uh, social work support for students. The, I think the high school has two social workers. I think the Pond Cove has one and a half. And, and the middle school has one. Mm -hmm. And because of that age group, that um, it seemed that they needed more than one and two seemed reasonable. And so we talked with you about a social worker. And um, so you have every reason to wonder, and it and, and was else does, why isn't it still a social worker? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I'm going to ask um, Mr. Eastman to help speak, speak to some of, the, of his thinking on this. But um, I think that the feeling was that people who are assigned right or wrong to do, to, to work uh, as social workers in our schools are spending uh, the lion's share, if not all of their time, um, working with children that have those services written into their IEP, which l limits, uh, which, which excludes around 80% of our entire student body. 80% uh, of our kids do not have an IEP. Yep. Um, and yet there are kids that would benefit from a social worker um, who are not in special ed. And, and part of it, I have to wonder is, why do we write that into so many IPs? It's another question, but it's certainly a related question. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe that should be also looked at over time, is, is that really something that needs to be in an IEP, which when we write that in an IEP, we have to provide that service. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what, Mr. Eastman was talking about was maybe working toward a position that has those that training and skills, but um, provides a broader range of services to the larger uh, school population, and not to be taking on um, not to, to, to continue the direct um, to the, the the limiting. Uh, but important role played by social workers in working primarily with children with an IEP. Um, and I know that we've received letters from several social workers in our district really concerned about that and wondering, gee, you know, this, this may be the wrong direction, um, that maybe we need to have just more of what we're already doing. And I think that we could uh, justify that just doing more of what we're doing. But it would mean that this idea of Mr. Eastman that we serve the larger student body is going to be, um, you, you, can't go, you can't do both, you can't go both ways with it. So is that a fair way to lead into? scope of the job description of social worker is that we currently have um, and my social worker is she's out straight I think maybe some of it's over identified services and we're working on how do, how do we really better um, kind of monitor who qualifies for those services but it's largely if you look at the job description of a social worker is largely IEP I mean there's a lot that special ed referenced all through it and I don't mind that and I think we need it and it's very important and I think they do a great job but as soon, that really didn't fit the need that after halfway through the year that I see that we need. 
I think what we need is somebody to really address the needs of the larger school population. Not that they can't as a social worker, but their time does get prioritized differently. Because as soon as something's written into an IEP on the social worker, that, they're gonna do that first. So if we have another one, my fear would be that in two years we just have more services written in. Because everybody, we all could use more services. But so that was really the goal and the rationale behind it. Um, I've looked at, and I was asked to change the job title. I had it as homeschool coordinator um, because I'm trying to really find something that meets the greater need of our school. Um, teachers need more supports in their classrooms, and, and it's not always that therapeutic level of counseling. The school counselor, the school social worker job description is an LCSW. It can't, it's not an LSW even. So that kind of narrows down the scope. And it's, and it's a higher level. They can provide a level of therapeutic counseling. I don't think that's what the greater school really is demanding right now. I think the greater school is demanding um, the support and the connection. I don't know what tasks you deemed as administrative in there, because I don't, I try not to, I, I didn't, that wasn't the plan, was to be administrative. Um, the plan I is to help. I think she's probably referring to the attendance part, which I read differently than she does, which is monitoring students who have high, Absenteeism, which may be tied to mental illness or depression or something. Or some kids just won't come to school. Right, for whatever yeah. reason. So right now, I mean, just so we know, and Kathy kind of alluded to it, there's several ways to be a failing school. Some of your test scores, and one is to fall, have your attendance rate fall before, below 95%. We're at 95.5%. So somehow we need to be able to do that. Uh, and really, that attendance is, is not really something that the ad, admin does. You're not going to go punish someone for not coming to school. That's not a way to really make them come to school. Um, but it's really about connecting services and community services. And that's how I would see the role of this social, that type of a social worker, much less clinical and much more holistic. Um, so so the, the answer is it could be a, a social worker. That was part of one of the job descriptions. It could be an LCSW. It could, it's kind of, you know, to steal Howard's phrase of, of casting a broad net to try to find the right person. Um, so I get it because that's not what we talked about in, in, the, in the budget. Um, but to me, I, I think instead of passing it because that's the wording we use, I think it's right to get the right job and the right support for all, these, all the kids and all the teachers. So this is kind of a discussion question for everybody, including you, Troy. Um, I struggled with this last time you were here too, not because I don't believe that there that there is this broader need in that connection of services, but I also think that there are needs for counseling in school. And so is the problem not the name of the job, but that the job description that we have is not correct. And that we need to, re we need to look at what a social worker is, is, because I know that regular ed students are accessing social workers at the high school. I know them. They're getting great support from Ms. Nato, for instance. Um, I, so, like, is it, you know, we do, I, I just want to be careful. I don't disagree with the need, but is it that we need to change the job description? I'm throwing out the idea. Sure. So, if what I'm hearing is correct, and correct me if I'm wrong, so it sounds like what we're saying is that the current social worker's time is, just gets filled up, and that if we added a second social worker, it would get filled up in a similar fashion because... I don't know that, but I would anticipate that's, that. That's it, okay, so what I'm, what I'm concerned about is that we want to add a social worker so that just those, just those regular ed kids, not the kids that might need and have attendance problems, but just that kid that needs and that's what this that, that thing isn't going to be sort of they're still not going to have the services that they, they need. And I, I really am kind of stuck on this, provide mental health services to students within the school setting. And that we lost that, and it's a very different. Well, we may be able to add that into that. Yeah. I mean, I just, that's my proposal of, of what it would be. But um, just to be clear, our social worker does would provide currently services to a regular education student or all students, but not after, not until 
the needs of everything right. else have been yeah. bad. Right. Yeah. I, I understand yeah. that. So yeah. it's a triage kind of situation. So so my goal is, and what, what I've written is, this person would absolutely be able to do what you just stated. Mm -hmm. um, we also have school counselors that provide that, that service um, as well. However, the school counselors are also responsible for providing career, you know, career education curriculum and you know, bullying curriculums and all of those things. So, so their plates are f not full, but they have a lot going on too that kind of can't allow them to solely be the, the keeper of that either. So. so I, I just had a question sort of reading through this. It seems that some of the things that are on this list in terms of things like even some of the attendance monitor, the case management, um, some of the home school stuff, um, it, are things that your social worker may be doing now for certain kids, is there a part of this that will relieve some of that for, and focus more on the in-school service? So that maybe we may have kids with IEP that where some of those tasks are actually, that they're currently handling, might be handled by this person and that they have more time. So yes, yeah, so this, so, so an IEP. overlap. Yeah, so an IEP would not prohibit someone from accessing this person right. either. Yes. Right. So. So some of those could be crossover services. Absolutely, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't prevent some, an IEP would not prevent someone from accessing this new position. So, so I guess, so speaking of my own, um, it, it seems that um, your current social worker has much of her time filled. Oh. And not all of that is the ther therapeutic counseling piece. There's a lot of other stuff that goes along That's with right. that. That's right. And, and this might be able to alleviate some of that, which would leave space for more, as well as the other. Just, so this is sort of somewhat wraparound and somewhat also broader view. Correct. Is that, that's, yep. that's sort of what I understood it to be. Yep. So I don't think all of our social work, current social worker time is built in totally therapeutic, but it's all in support of. So I think that your comment about what's in the job, this other job description is still relevant. And if that's really part of it, it just needs to be in here too. Mm -hmm. right. I was wondering out loud if um, what, if, if one of the major concerns here is the job title, would it, would it be um, helpful to just simply go back to calling this job social worker and then and then assign the person hired to take on specific specific task mm -hmm. as their annual assignment. That certainly addresses a, a good portion of the concern because I also think the title is is problematic for us in terms of just look at what we what we've been through this year with with professional staff and and the, and the, you know the analysis that's going into every level. So we, we budget for the social worker. It should be we should be adding a social worker, not you know, changing what it is and adding a different headcount. Well, it gets to the heart of my, my point, too, which is why can't we hire a social worker and ask him or her to do what we need them to do? Yeah. Well, my, well, my so caution. Get radical here now. I know. Well, I, crazy. I, just, I think as soon as, but when you hire one and their job description is as a social worker is currently written, their, their priority is going to go first to any of the IEP stuff. We can that's sure get gonna, right on that job description. We you were allowed to do that. So I would that. like to review it. I'm all for that. I would have done that a long time ago. We are allowed to do that, and we are encouraging you to do that. So, so I would, that to me would work really well. Um, the only other part is the social worker has written. Also, the qualification is only LCSW. So I would like to see that expand to... LCSW or LSW, which is a licensed social worker. Um, DHS has licensed social workers that remove kids from homes. So, I, so an LSW is a licensed state social worker, a licensed social worker. An LCSW can provide clinical counseling. So it's a higher level. Um, but I think sometimes I'm not sure that all those things are that important for everything that we need. So why not? So maybe you want to revise the and to change the job title to social worker and then direct the administration to review and revise the job description. Perfect. Um, which social worker would you want, if we change it to social worker, would you want an LCSW? No, I think it should be both. Broader? I think it needs to be a wider net. Okay. Of so we could just make which, an amendment to revise it to say social worker. In fact, I'm going to make an amendment. 
to revise the motion to say social worker instead of student services coordinator um, and advise the administration to work on the job description. Direct. I direct you to do that? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, I can do that. <laughs> so just as a closing. And I'll probably need a second. So this is a closing note of that. I guess there was an article in the newspaper about it. I was quoted, I don't know, it must be from being on camera. Um, I've had four people call that are already interested. They're like, that's the job, that's what we're all needing. <laughs> I just talked to somebody from South Portland today, I've talked to, they call and say, that's how you describe that is what we all need. So I think we're down the right path. I don't, I mean, I, I think it would be neater to do exactly what you're proposing. So, good. I think I need a second on my I second. Okay. So, um, John? We're to discuss, we're going to vote on the amendment and we'll discuss, discuss the amendment, so. I'm going to just, we can discuss, we're not going to vote yet. Yeah, did you want to say something, discuss so, something? So, I, I was just going to say, say that, um, I, I think it is important to get this right partly because of the environment that we're, we're in, mm -hmm. we're looking at what those services are, and um, I think this heads, the amendment heads us down the right path. I don't think it's any different than you described, no, perfect. but we have to cross the T's and dot the I's to make, and um, this will make it more sustainable as we go forward. Good. Yeah, sir? Yeah, I'd like to see uh, this job description in a standard uh, template that we may have, because it looks like this is what Mr. Um, Troy has written on his behalf. There must be a template to fill this in because all these remarks need to go in the properly places. Because I am finding like under professional responsibilities, item four and five is more of qualification, not a task. So I would like to see if there is a template already, a standard job description or responsibility that we put out to the public. So I'd like to see this in that format. I want to say thank you, Hope, for, for raising this um, this point. I think, um, like John just said, it's you know, in the environment we are in. I think it it behooves us to um, try to avoid having to explain ourselves down the road what we're doing. That said, um, you know I, I've understood since since you made this suggestion, I've I've understood what your goal is, mm -hmm. and you know maybe we went off course with. Um, you know, changing from social worker to student service, but you are identifying a need. And originally we were just focusing on, okay, who fits that need, you know, quick knee-jerk reaction of social worker. And so I, I really appreciate your, your going deeper into what we truly need, what the middle school needs. And um, if, if, you know, this can help both ends, great. And it sounds like it will, but, but I believe you've tapped into something that is long overdue that needs care and Thanks. addressing. So I want to thank you very much. Good. For this. Agreed. Could, could I just ask, so I think what we've all discussed makes sense with going back to the social work title. Um, I just wondered, are, I, I don't know within schools if it has to be a social worker or for an LCPC is a possibility or if other, um, if, if our title excludes other... Um, so I think, the, I think the title social worker is pretty inclusive. Yeah. But then when you look at it and it's only one qualification and it's LCSW, I think it becomes exclusive. So, so I think the, the job title itself, and that's why, I always, that's why originally I thought that would fit our need. Right. But then when you look into it closer, it kind of, and that would be another way to kind of help okay. divide between some of the IEP work too. So. I hope that I'm that we're not defeating the purpose of your like I, I I'm sort of coming around to what you were what you're trying yeah. to do, um, and I hope by doing this by going back to the title social worker broadening the qualifications tweaking the responsibilities will you still be able to get to that point that you were oh I think we'll doing? absolutely get there I mean my hesitation is being the new guy coming in and, and rewriting somebody else's job description sure yeah, I would much rather just come up with the one that, you know, Make people have been hired. He's leaving. People have been he hired under and the, everybody will be angry. You know, people have been hired <laughs> under that previous job description. I don't want to offend them by changing their job description. So to me, it made more sense to, 
that was my only real goal in going that way, because I think we can accomplish it this way as well. Um, but coming from you, that's not me. So, so, so that's so, perfect. So, so maybe we need like social worker two. Yeah, some create, <laughs> create, a, create a separate. Well, I think that it's really hard when you hire something that you already exist, but you're trying to have a different job. Mm -hmm. It's hard for people to get out of that lane and think of the job as something different. Hollywood South is social worker two. I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All those in favor? <laughs> social worker two it is. Thank you, Troy. Thank you. <laughs> Item 6F. No motion. Um, um, no motion needed because their first read, mm -hmm. but um, I'll just say that the policy committee had its final meeting for the school year, and um, I think that um, with the help of Kathy Stankard, the building principals, and um, the association, I think we have kind of figured out around the transferring and hiring certified and licensed professional employees policy, the, um, the muddiness is really in the contract and not in the policy. And so I'm saying this out loud again so that we all remember next time we're in negotiations, we wanted to do some clarifying in that language. Um, in the end, we really just wanted to make sure that it was clear that people that were transferring, understanding that a transfer is a lateral move, a transfer doesn't mean um, ed tech to teacher because that's not a transfer. A transfer would be teacher to teacher in a different building or nurse to nurse, something like that. Um, understanding um, that if you were even working part time and a position came open that you needed to apply and not just be considered for a transfer. So trying to kind of clean that up a little bit. Um, we also have been working on um, IKB and IKBR, which are um, our homework policies and procedures. What we have really found, I think, is that our homework policy, for the most part, is pretty solid. It's the kind of the understanding and communication around that, which could be improved. Um, we also have been a little bit more explicit in the um, administrative procedures on um, the home. So there's the policy and then there are the guidelines. So the guidelines, we've gotten a little bit more specific about um, kind of time recommendations and you know what, what can parents do if they feel like their students are struggling with, with those, you know, those time recommendations. And really it's about communicating with teachers and having discussion and trying to figure out you know, why, is your, why is the student struggling to, you know, to complete whatever. And so understanding you know, at the elementary level what homework is really supposed to be and who's supposed to be doing it. And again, in middle school, how long you know, in general might your student need to work on this? And if they're just banging their heads against the wall and, and upset, it's OK to say, we're going to stop this tonight going to email your teacher and we're going to have a conversation about this and figure out what's going on. And then again, understanding in high school, there's a, like another, a higher threshold of, you know, it's going to be more, high, more homework. You're, you know, preparing for college and getting ready and these are difficult classes. But again, if there's something going on that's really, you know, keeping you from getting your, your homework or your project done or whatever, the point that we keep making over and over again is communicate with the teacher. Sit down and meet with the teacher and, and, and see what's going on. See if you can work something out, that sort of thing. Um, I'd like to thank Sherry Gustafson, I think I said that right, a parent who has been very involved, has brought research and um, come to each policy meeting regarding homework. And it's wonderful to have parents and community members participate. Policy is not everybody's um, exciting place to be. So it's, it's nice to have that. Um, and finally, we've been looking at JLCB, which is immunizations of students in um, communicable diseases. The administrative procedure around that has recently been updated just to make sure that we are in complete compliance with the law. The law states that um, if students are going to, um, if parents are going to 
send their students to school and um, choose not to immunize them, that they must sign that waiver uh, with all documentation and it must be on file before the first day of school. And the students may not come to school until the paperwork is on file. And um, so that is gonna seem a little different to some people who have not always been great about getting their paperwork in, but the nurses are really, um, make, want, us, want us to be in step with the law. So um, we've already gotten an email, I believe, and we will probably be getting several reminders over the summer to make sure that all paperwork is updated and if you're choosing not to immunize that you need to sign and you understand the consequences of not immunizing if there is an outbreak of um, an identified disease so that there aren't any misunderstandings about how long your student has to stay home, for instance. So I'd like to thank um, Jill, um, Jill Young and um, Aaron Taylor and Deb Braxton for working on this. We will, the policy meeting, uh, committee will meet um, sometime toward the end of August and um, usually we like to have a, an extended meeting to try to ramp up uh, a number of policies to be ready for the beginning of the school year. So stay tuned for that fun meeting. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Elizabeth. So, um, thanks for all your work. Um, I was just gonna weigh in briefly on the homework policy. Um, it's something I may have a bit of an outline view on um, but I actually think it's actually really important. So I looked at the current homework policy, and I actually have a concern, particularly around the way that it's structured, uh, particularly in elementary school, um, where there's really, as you point out, there's not a particular benefit other than attitude. And I would question whether homework is really the best thing if you're trying to get an attitude improvement. Um, and it's sort of ramped up 10 minutes, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, as if it's linear. And I don't think those skills are linear. I think they're completely non-linear. I think when you're able to handle homework, you're able to handle homework. And I think kids really need to be more kids, uh, particularly in this community. And I think it's a real challenge for us here in CAVE to be mindful of trying to do less and do what we do better. Um, and I, I think in some respects that the idea that we ramp it up that way is actually misguided and does not have a benefit and kids would be much better off without any homework. And then the other piece of that is, we have a lot about students and parents in our homework policy. The missing piece of this, particularly in middle school and even so in high school, is um, getting the homework, A, complying with what the type of homework that it's really supposed to be, because I look at the list of what's supposed to be on there, and I see homework that doesn't look like that, and I don't think anybody's looking at it. And the other thing is, no one's aware of what any one kid has. And that's a lot for a fifth or sixth grader to handle. Someone at the school side, both I think in the middle school and the high school, needs to be looking at what do they really have. Okay, maybe it's math homework on Wednesdays and language arts on Tuesdays. So you know what kids have overall. What's the whole picture? The only person who has the, the whole picture is the kid. And the kid's not ready to handle that, not in fifth grade. And so the, I, I would ask that in the, when we revisit what the homework policy looks like, that there's an administrative teacher, an oversight piece that makes us match, because I don't think we're close. So John, we didn't bring the actual policy, only the- I, I understand. We are in process on exactly that, which is hope, expecting teachers you know, across grade level to collaborate in the elementary, you know, to, so that there's a collaboration and a communication around understanding, okay, I'm assigning a big project, so we're gonna back off and wait and that sort of thing. Uh, 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 I guess what I'm saying is included in that has to be where we check that it's happening at the administrative level. Because I can tell you right now, the homework that's described and what should be assigned as homework, even in this administration, is not happening. Okay, so, and, and if it's not, then we're not getting the benefit that we think we're getting. So, I, I just think that it's like, this is something where getting, doing it for the, the sake of doing homework is a big mistake. Doing homework right, fine, I got it, but we need to really do it right. And I think in elementary school we're not, and in middle school, and, and across the board I don't think we're doing a great job of it right now. And the policy is the way we can help fix this, and I think it really needs deep attention to, 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 like I said, get those benefits that we're hoping for, because um, we have a long way to go, I think, right now. 
in terms of knowing what we're doing and monitoring it. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate all the work today. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I don't have language to suggest, just, just concepts. I'll probably be there in August. I was going to say, please come in August. We know you stand, John. <laughs> what? So we know you stand now. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, let's see, now we are moving on to 6G. May I have a motion, please? I move we consider to approve the superintendent's nominations of new personnel for the 2018-19 school year. Amy DeVries, high school science teacher, Kyle Moray, middle school assistant principal, and Danielle Scully, kindergarten teacher. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Item 6H, may I have a motion? Could I just say for that, I really appreciated having um, the attachments in our packet that gave us a little bit of information about um, the people we were approving. Mm -hmm. I found that to be very helpful. You did get it, didn't you? I did, okay. yes. So I'm, I'm saying oh, thank I'm you. I appreciated <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Thumbs up. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, my Lord. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, it was it, good. It, it was, it, it was it's important that you would get that good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And in fact, I would ask you if you didn't get it to not vote. You really need to be sure that you know and are comfortable yeah. with what was being recommended. Yeah. So um, but thank you for reading it, too. Uh, item 6H, may I have a motion, please? I move we grant the superintendent of schools authority to hire school personnel excluding administrative positions which will require board approval during the summer. And a second? A second. Yep. Okay. Any discussion? This, this uh, is the just, usual thing we do. Just, uh, this it's is important. what we do every June, um, which, is, which is great. And uh, I think we've asked Howard that uh, he's going to run by names mm -hmm. um, as he goes along the process so that we can just have first eyes on them um, before, you know, and let Howard know if there's any reason for concern. Let me add in. Yeah. And anyone who is hired for a professional job, you would get that same backup information. It wouldn't just be a name. It would just, you'll, right. Okay. I'd like to note, though, um, so typically at this time, or at this time, we like to uh, see who we are going to have for co-curricular and that sort of thing. So. The board is looking forward to seeing that in the near future. Yeah, thank you. You'll get it. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Okay. Item 6I. May I have a motion, please? I move that we consider to approve the following 2018-19 athletic and co-curricular administrative personnel nominations mm -hmm. as... The I. What? Where? 6I. Oh. Much easier. Pick the right one. I move to approve the following 2017-18 co-curricular personnel nominations. John Sundling, Technical Director, one-third of Stipend, Rebecca Willie, Musical Director, Christine Marshall, Theater Assistant, two-thirds of Stipend. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Item 6J, may I have a motion? I move we approve the following 2018-2019 athletic and co-curricular administrative personnel nominations as listed in our packet under item 6, I believe 6J, is it 6? We're still on 6. Yeah. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? Move a second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Item 6K, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School football team trip to Camp Caribou in Winslow, Maine, August 13th through 18th, 2018. Any, a second? Oh, oh. Uh, any discussion? I'd like to ask the same question I always ask, which is, is everybody on the team, um, you know, allowed and, and given the opportunity to participate in this trip? You know, is there a cost to it, and is there fundraising made available to the students that might not be able to afford this trip? 
Yeah, that's two hundred seventy-five dollars. Two seventy-five. Jeff would be the best. I don't know the details of this particular trip. I think that that would be consistent with all of them. Right. Is this a trip that, that they do every year, or is this, no, this, is a, this is a new one? A new one. And those who are seniors and graduated, do they participate? I think not. No. Okay. Well, probably in college, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. okay, all those in favor? Okay, item 6 out. may I have a motion? The, the, again, these were handed to me earlier by Catherine. They're just all the vouchers that need to be reviewed and right, signed. Right, and we received them in our packet also. Oh, so you did? We did. Oh, wow. But this, these are the ones that have to be signed. Okay. So if anybody, John or anybody, has anything to point out in, in Catherine's absence, um, otherwise. I move we approve the monthly financials included as part of the business meeting agenda materials. Okay. I have a second. I second that. Okay. Any discussion? Um, I hope Catherine feels better. All those in favor? Okay, so we're wrapping up here. Um, we're moving on to committee reports. We've gone through policy. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm not doing policy. No, I know. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> um, the, let's see, the uh, town comp planning um, group had a public forum um, on last week, I believe it was, and it was not as well attended as the first one. We didn't have all our um, Ted Jordan history students here as we did the first time, and we missed their, their um, participation, but it was, it was still an interesting discussion. Um, we will have one and more, that's it, in, um, in the fall, no date yet set, but I encourage everyone, again, as always, to please um, participate and communicate. Um, school board agenda requests. Okay. This isn't so much an agenda request, but just a reminder <laughs> that um, it's probably a great idea for the, the board to set aside some time this summer to meet with a new superintendent right. um, beyond just our standard um, you know, goal setting <laughs> retreat, but really to, to get to start working with the superintendent and, and um, really look ahead together. So I just want to throw that out there as, you know, a high priority for the board, not as a business meeting, but mm -hmm. probably more of a retreat style and, and hopefully there can be a portion of time with district administrators as well. So it might be an extended chunk of time that people need to look at their work day or something like that because it's yeah. important. It's really important and um, Donna, as you can imagine, um, is swamped right now tying up um, mm -hmm. her her last um, days at her current district. Um, but I know that she's eager starting July, shortly after July 1, um, mm -hmm. to start talking about getting dates together for something like that. Um, announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, so before we go, before we adjourn, um, I think there's there's one, two things that I want to say. One, um, I know just I, I know that uh, most people were aware that our town lost um, a very dear, valuable um, parent and former school board member and chair, Mary Townsend, um, last week, and we just want to note that she um, added so much to um, our lives and is missed already and we wish the best to her family as they go through this very, very um, difficult time. Um, I took Mary's seat uh, when she stepped down from the uh, school board and um, it was, she was really her who encouraged me that I could, I, to believe in myself that I could do it, that you know, having a big heart and a willingness to um, step up was basically all you really needed to get going. So. I wouldn't have done it without her, her push, hers and Sarah's, Lennon's push. Um, and then, so finally, um, m m Howard being Howard does not want any kind of uh, uh, special occasion for his last um, month here with us, but I really wanted to take this opportunity tonight 
um, in a really casual, laid-back way, uh, to, <laughs> to say um, how much um, you have meant to us, how much you have brought to this district. Uh, I chose not to write anything down formally because then you might think that's just too serious. So I came up with a bunch of words um, that make me think of you. Um, and first I just want to say that your arrival here to the district has been a breath of fresh air. Thank you. And I really feel like um, personally but also as a board, you've elevated our role and our understanding to a level that I had not had uh, prior to your arrival. Um, you've helped us understand um, the importance of not taking things too seriously, but also the importance to know when to take things seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think that balance um, that you strike is um, its a natural for you. You have a, this capacity to vacillate between, you know, approachable, but just head on, on your shoulders straight. Um, and I've learned already so much from you in these two years. Um, but I think, you know, the words I think about you um, and the list can go on and on. You are one of the most respectful people I've ever met. You are endearing. You are curious, much like Dr. Ef Efron. Um, I've always admired how, you know, the first time you are, you meet someone or you're meeting or seeing them again for the first time in a little while, you're always first one to ask, engage with them and ask them questions and it, um, it's gone noticed. And I really appreciate that and I think it's a remarkable quality. Um, you're very, very kind. Your integrity is, um, you know, first class. You are a most classy man. Mm, thank you. Um, very humble. And um, you're also very hilarious, and I love that. And um, I think you, best of all, bring out the best in others. Mm -hmm. We're really going to miss you, Howard. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, too. Nancy, for sharing your husband mm -hmm. with us. Um, I know it's been a long, long road these two years, and uh, it hasn't been easy, but... Mm. It's made such a difference in our district. It's been exciting for everybody. Okay. Thank you, Nancy. So. Thank you. And um, we, we have a little card from the, the board so, somewhere on the uh, table, but I'm sure okay. others might want to say some things too, so you just got to That's okay. I, I've heard plenty. So, so. <laughs> it's too, too bad. It's very sweet of you. We're, we're not going to adjourn yet. We, we do have a few more words to say. <laughs> okay. So I, I just like to give my, my personal thanks and, and to, to you. Um, I, I gotta say, for uh, an interim superintendent, you certainly made a really permanent impact. Um, it's been such a breath of fresh air to have someone who's so experienced to be able to look around and see with fresh eyes some of the good things we do we forget about and some of the bad things we do we don't notice. Um, I'm reminded of, uh, I, I played squash briefly for a little while and I was learning and I was watching with someone else and he said, now watch this guy. And I was watching a guy who was playing, he was probably um, an octogenarian and he was playing a guy who was about 35. And the squash courts are small. And so he said, watch, watch this guy. And the, and the guy who was 35 was like running all over the court like crazy. And the guy who was 80 would like take two steps, the ball would be there, bang, he would hit it. Because he knew how to play the game. He knew where he needed to be. He knew what was important. He knew where the ball was going to bounce. And he was there before it hit the ground. And as a superintendent who's been around the block, that's what you were able to do for us. And we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, it's been, uh, we've learned a tremendous amount. You've pointed us in the right direction. And you've raised our aspirations for what we can be. And we really appreciate that. And all with a great deal of warmth and a smile. So we really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, John. I really appreciate it. Um, I've only been here for a few months, but during the negotiation process, this is, this is not anything, any secrets, but there's a time period, you spend a great deal of time with people when you're negotiating, and you often go into caucus where the other side is doing their business, but you just have to sort of fill the time. And during that time, I'm a new board member, and, and Howard starts telling us these stories. <laughs> and the, 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 during that time, we became, I, I think I got to know you fairly well, and I, I would go home and I'd say, this is so fun, I love these people, they're so great, this is, is this what it's always gonna be like? And then things went south from there after the budget season started. <laughs> <laughs> but I just wanna say, I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to be able to work with you uh, as a new board member. I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount from you, and I do often say to myself, what would Howard do? And that is something that, as an ongoing basis, that's what I think of. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, Howard, there's no doubt that you've left, led this district to a stronger place, as we've mentioned. Um, you've built trust and you've built connection back with the people of this district. I think you have a quiet strength that is full of deep conviction and integrity. Um, I also think you're a very humble leader uh, without ego and really there with the student's best interest in all of your decisions. Um, you, you create this energy around you. People just want to be around you. Um, and I'm not sure if it's the mustache or... <laughs> That's what uh, it is. I think it's the smile <laughs> underneath the mustache that just lights up the whole face. So kind of a joke, but also true, I think, a little bit. Um, personally, I've learned so much from you, watching you, uh, listening to you, talking to you, um, about just how to be graceful and easeful and truthful. Um, I have the deepest respect for you. I'll, I'll miss your energy and what you've brought to this, but I also wish you and Nancy the best back up in Mount Desert Island and uh, back home. So thank, thank you, so you for much. everything. It's been a treat. Yeah. Okay. Kimberly, oh, sorry. Uh, no, yet. sorry, Norbert. <laughs> 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 Buckle up. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I'll start with you, Nancy. I, I haven't met you, but I've heard such nice things about you from Howard, and I appreciate so much you sharing him with our district the last two years. He's been such a gift to us, and I'm sure it's been hard not having him with you. But thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, Howard, I remember, um, I don't think I was even on the board yet, but the very first, um, it was the, like, you know, coming back from summer meeting, and I had so many friends call, and they were like, this guy's amazing. His very first thing was, you know, Cape is for chill out. <laughs> and, and you, from the get-go, just set such a nice tone for our district. I think it was exactly what we needed at that time, but um, I, just the, the teachers I knew were really buoyed um, starting off, and I, I appreciate that and would look forward to getting to know you, and it's been such a pleasure. Um, you're a man with incredible integrity, honesty. You care deeply about people. Um, I am perpetually perplexed by how you're early for every meeting and yet you seem to have a moment for anyone and I don't and I know you're incredibly busy in the in-between time and I don't know how um, how you do that but you um, I, I don't think there's ever been a time when you know I've had something to say and, and you seem rushed or in a hurry to move on to the next thing and um, and I appreciate that uh, you're incredibly genuine I, I could go on and on, um, but you've led us incredibly well, and I think our district is in such a stronger place after two years with you at the helm. I'm only saddened that it's only two years that, that you're with us, um, and I just feel incredibly honored and fortunate that I've been able to work with you during thank these you two years. Me. It's been a, it's been a treat. Learned a tremendous amount from you, so thank you. Thank you. So I think back to. Um, our interview and um, you let us know that you weren't necessarily going to be a conventional interim if we went with you and that was intriguing <laughs> that was no joke it was fantastic and you have been a gift to us and um, it's been my honor to work with you thank you and learn from you thank you thank you yeah, how well, I, I guess I haven't spent as much time with you, um, but I did discover you at the Cape Diversity uh, Coalition meetings. And uh, what I observe about you is that most leaders lack, uh, is that you're a great listener. You are an awesome listener. And so my only regrets are that I have not spent enough time with you to learn more from you but it seems like you have set the footprints in this district and uh, you, made, you educated us and uh, we are the level that um, I s somehow feel sorry for Donna 
because you were standing <laughs> on the way up here. And so we were probably expecting a lot from her thanks to you. And uh, thanks for educating us and uh, making us uh, prepare to take the district forward. Thank you, Nasser. Thank yes, you. We appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm exhausted. I'm emotionally worn out. I, uh, I'm touched um, a great deal by, by all that you've said, and I'm going to miss you all. We'll find you. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. I want to know if our budget passed. I know. I, I keep checking. I keep checking. I keep checking. Would, keep would checking. you call me tonight? Yeah. You want me to call you? In the middle of the night. Okay. I, want, I want to know. Okay. We all want to know. All right. Um, so may I have a motion? I move we adjourn. All right. Second. Oh, all those in favor? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claude. Thank you, Howard. <laughs>